Hello and welcome to Views from the Market, Mid-Market Private Equity and M&A in Canada. My name is Mario Negro, and I'm a partner in the Private Equity and M&A group at Stegman Elliott. For today's podcast, I'd like to welcome our guest, Sabina Veit. Sabina is the founder of Backerhouse Veit, and Backerhouse Veit is a Canadian frozen bread manufacturer, and Sabina founded, built, and sold Backerhouse Veit to a private equity firm. It's great to have you here, Sabina, and looking forward to this to hear your story. But first, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here and tell my story because I think it's a good one. So I started out as a young entrepreneur and go the full gamut, being a woman in times where women did not get a big voice. It was a lot of fun and I must say I still miss it. So I was 24 years old when I started and I won't date myself too much, but it's a long time ago. It's over 30 years ago. And I really was passionate about it. I grew up in Germany, but I immigrated as a young woman to Canada. Eventually had a couple of children and no future and no education to really do anything with myself in a failing marriage. So I said to my father, well, I want to start a bakery. That's where we come from. That's what I know. And he says, well, you're a woman. You're not a baker. Hands off. I wouldn't give up. And eventually he gave me some seed capital and told me to call him and I'm bankrupt. And I came close a few times. I can't deny that. And over the course from 87 to 2018, it's been an interesting journey growing a manufacturing company of a high intense capital. We were first retail stores, as I knew it from Europe, and my father very much supported that idea. And it quickly was clear that the Canadian market did not support. That was way before bakery cafes. That was way before we kind of looked at baked goods a little bit different. So I wasn't going anywhere fast and I was essentially doing one third of the volume, the beginning of the week, two thirds towards the end. And with equipment that wasn't specced to handle these sorts of increment, you know, these sorts of changes in the course of a week or people for that matter. So I had to decide three years into it what I was going to be. So I decided to go frozen. At this time, there was a different process in Europe, but the process here and half constructing through the first plant, it ended up that the technology that was needed to bring this, what's called back then, public frozen or pre-proofed frozen. So that is frozen dough that goes into a piece of equipment and gets refinished in the bakeries. Was not working in North America, too many inconsistencies on a retail level. So then it went to public frozen. And as we had to shift gears very quickly, invest more. And I went into the States because I was going bankrupt. This wasn't going to go anywhere. So we went and do a lot of trade shows, had our first big U.S. customer. I love the U.S. And U.S. customers, they can feel the passion of somebody starting up and they support new ideas. And when the truck started to roll, I started to get confidence in what I was doing was the right thing to do. And so we kept building it. But again, it is highly, highly capital intensive. At one point, we had 80% U.S. sales. It was a bit unnerving to me, given how the politics were going. Then 9-11 happened, and it was clear we needed to pull back. And I grew my Canadian business more aggressively. We kept the U.S. business, but we kind of eventually were almost 50-50, 60-40, 50-50. It kind of bounced around. Retail and food service learned a lot about the changing market, changing consumer profiles. And really enjoyed it. I love baking. I love the feel of dough. I love the smell of it. I could never work in meat. So I love grain. I love the people that I had such great loyalties. It always comes down to the people. I'm a big believer in your culture, in being an immigrant, in growing immigrants and helping immigrants. So the business kept growing. And eventually we had to decide to go for the big expansion. So we bought a big building finally. And this is the Mississauga facility. Mississauga, yeah, that was 150,000 square foot. And we bought and then invested about $20 million into it. And that investment was all your capital and bank, bank and you. Bank and me. Got the cube to prove it from the bank. (laughs) (laughs) And so I'm a huge believer in hiring people that are smarter than oneself as an entrepreneur. I'm a believer in you need to park your ego and you need to park some of your vision at times because you fail. If I would have insisted on keeping doing what my father even was doing and what I believed so much in, probably wouldn't have been able to scale it. And so I had a really good management team. I was able to abdicate a lot of responsibilities. And I've learned at some point that as an entrepreneur, you need to build a team so that the company runs without you. You can be the figurehead, but you cannot be the one who's making all the decisions. And I think that's really important for entrepreneurs to learn because good stuff is coming out of your team when you let a little go. And I've learned that and that was a great journey. 
I want to talk about the sale of your business because I think it's a fascinating story on many levels. You had obviously grown this business and it was doing well. And owners come to a decision to sell for different reasons. Why did you decide it was time to sell? It was less than five years after the expansion and my management team and particular president of the company came to me and says, look, we're about 18 months away from another 20 million. If you want to scale this, you want to keep writing the big RFPs, you want to be with the bigger boys, that's all a margin game. We need to automate. And I really had to sit down and he asked me point blank. The relevant sentence was, how many more times are you going to do this? I said, oh, I don't know. I have young kids. I'm not going anywhere. But he says, it is risky. It's getting riskier. Why don't we check around? So we decided to just go out there and check what the multiples in the space are. And we got three different companies involved in giving us a good feel on our space. In this case, food service, bakery manufacturing. And we're frankly blown away by the multiples. We were blown away by the interest. We settled in with one of the M&A companies. And we thought we had hit the jackpot with Mario and the fellow from this other company. And I didn't know that in May, we were gone in October. This is how quickly it happened. It was a hard summer to work at it. There's a lot of learning, a lot of decisions to make. Mario and the m and company ask a lot of good questions. And I think that is really important to know for, as an entrepreneur to ponder these questions from the get-go. Like, what do you want? Do you want to stay on? Do you want to have all cash? Do you want to take some shares back? How are you going to protect your relevant employees? There's a set of questions you need to flush out. And then these answers in any interview with anybody who's interested in your business, you need to be ready to be asked. And I think that really flushes out immediately who is actually just kicking tires and who is interested. You ran a full process. You yeah. had a lot of interest. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Good interest. Your process was one where private equity played a big role. You ultimately sold to a private equity firm. You did not know private equity before. This is the first time you see these people. It's always interesting to hear an owner's perspective when they're selling to private equity. What are your thoughts on selling to private equity? What you learned from that? When we see the M&A process, we see private equity firms all the time. But for you, this is the first time in your life you've seen them. You saw a lot of them. There were a lot of interest in your business and you ultimately sold to one of them. Want to get your perspective on what you saw. And obviously you got confidence in one of them because you sold to one of them. What you saw in private equity your feeling about them as a buyer and your perspective? The feeling as a buyer, at time it was shocking because it's a set of thinking that as an entrepreneur, I don't think very few of us, certainly not me, possess. When every step is calculated, taking a company on, these guys are asking you questions to market data or they bring market people in that you have never, as a small entrepreneur, that I had never considered even contemplating on how I was looking at either my SKUs, how I was looking at running my equipment. And it was interesting, but it was frustrating because on one side is kind of like, okay, here you're contemplating selling your baby and the processes that they are entertaining as private equity, they were very different from, let's say, a strategic buyer that would fold you into a similar business. I ended up selling to private equity because I really liked the owner of the company I sold it to. I believe that they saw my vision. I believe that they felt the passion. They saw the loyalties, the culture in the business that made the product, that made us better than many other bakeries out there. That's what helped me sell to this particular private equity that I did not feel that from some of the others. But staying on at the board afterwards, I couldn't last too long. The conversations were so out of my thinking of what you do with, in this case, my dough and the equipment and the people and how to run it. That was just something I could not listen to any further. So I left the board a year later. Sabina, I mean, you, this was the first time you sold a business. You never sold one before. You're kind of experiencing all these players, all these people, all these processes. If you look back now and you think about the process, what do you find surprising or what are your feelings about the entire M&A process? Because for you, it's not something you're used to, but yet, you know, obviously it's the most important sale of your life. I think it came down to you and Howard, you know, it came down to the two people that ran this process and they kept me stable. The sales process as an experienced M&A company with a great lawyer on your side can support. That's what kept me sane because the amount of times I called Howard and I just said, wait a minute, this makes no sense. And he just kind of talked me through it. And then you underpinned it. As always in life, I think when it comes to something we don't know, we have to get people that are in the space that are literally knowing it. And that's all they do. And they can't be generalists. You got to go specific. You got to go to the guys that know 
how the steward you through this. That has been proven right for many important parts of my life and certainly this one. I know a lot of people that are in the spaces have done some of that, have assisted here and there. And it was suggested, yeah, yeah, you know, they can sell you this company. You can do it. It's not that difficult. I am bloody happy that I went with the professionals because my nerves would not have held up. I would have made a colossal mistake and cost myself an opportunity, I'm sure. I want to highlight one of the best parts of your story and it is one we see more, which is many owners stay on too long. They sell their businesses too late. They're older. They hold on to them a little bit too long. In your case, what I love about your story is you didn't kind of wait till you're retired to sell. You're still young. You still got energy. And I want to talk a little bit about that element of it, because often when we talk about owners selling, it really feels like it's the end. Whereas for you, it's like a new beginning. And maybe talk a bit about what you've been doing since the sale, because I think it's great. I think it's one of those stories that sometimes people think of owners as retiring when they sell and, you know, going into the sunset and living in Florida. So if you could give us a minute or two, talk about what you've been doing since. It's just a great story. Well, thank you. Well, I also believe that as an entrepreneur, unless you really, really want to retire and go golfing and traveling and live in Florida, which is not me, you need to park your mind somewhere before you sell. And I kind of knew this. And so at about the same process as the sales process during the same time, in my case, I went farm shopping and I bought a farm west of here, not too far from Toronto. And trying to develop into a retreat facility. I'm still doing all the new business development. I'm still struggling with rezoning in government red tape and what have you. But I've had a great three years just building, restoring, and dreaming up something that gives me a lot of joy and pleasure. And it will be another business to kind of nurture and grow. And it is, I believe, as we entrepreneurs should never rest. And we die if we rest. I certainly would. And so I love just nurturing and building this new farm property. And I hope that as soon as I've got it all figured out, Mario, you're going to be the first. <laughs> <What's fine? laughs> Once I'm ready to open. But yeah, I think it is really important to think that through. I did not have a lot of time to think through between the question, how much more money are you going to spend as an entrepreneur into your next millions to get you onto the next level and to struggle through the next Whatever it is that comes at you with labor issues, with regulatory issues, with management issues, you have to think it through. I do miss the infrastructure one creates over, in this case, 30 years. You don't create that. I'm sitting here with my first computer and, you know, two, three, four employees. And it is not the infrastructure I used to have. And it is harder, but it keeps me young and it keeps me interested and it teaches me stuff. And I think we should always learn and we should always grow. So that is what it's doing. And as an entrepreneur, I think you also get tired when I look back at my industry. I love my industry, but it's changed a lot. And do we get too tired to put in the next shoes? That's a question to ask us. Well, I don't know that I did not have the next shoes, but I certainly didn't have it the way I used to 20 years ago. I want to ask you about that. You're a new owner, operator, entrepreneur, and then you also have the experience of being one from 20 years ago. When you look back then and now trying to do what you're doing, from a macro perspective, is it harder to be an entrepreneur now? Is it easier when you compare what you were trying to do then and what you're trying to do now? I mean, obviously now you have resources, and more resources to help you. But when you look at the market for where you are, trying to make it as an owner operator, has it changed fundamentally? Is it easier? Is it harder? Just get your perspective on what you see. I think hard work still trumps everything. I think you have to be tenacious and you have to be fearless and you just have to stay with it. I don't think that part has changed. I think a lot of regulations have changed for sure. It's been made harder generally with red tape, but it's been made easier on women. Right? Not that I can leverage this currently. I could have leveraged that more in the bakery business, I think, and which I never have. But I think ethics have not really changed. I am very anti-social media. There's hyper-marketing that is very superficial. I love the telephone. I love real conversations. And that's a business I'm going into where it is about the people again. And we're always just in the people business. And I don't think that's changing as much as it seems it's changing. But human connections, I think we've learned that through COVID, is the most important to keep alive and to grow and nurture and culture and where we belong. And that's my intent to grow that again was a very special place as a gathering space. So it comes down to work, passion ethics, belief, and therefore, to me, it hasn't changed. I always ask our guests, I call it the crystal ball question, and I ask this question to you in this way. You started a new business at a crazy time. COVID, interest rates are going up, inflation. When you look at where you see the world going from where you are now, where do you see the opportunities? You still are out there 
doing this, even with all these macro forces that would have said, it's crazy time to do this. I'm like going down the river, but you still kept going. I want to hear your perspective on where you see things going from where you sit. In the space that I'm entering is about gatherings. It's about making people feel good. It's about bringing people together. It's about food and coming back to my roots. You know, you always break bread. Nobody doesn't like you over breaking bread. And so between food, a beautiful space, nature, and the opportunity to just be together, that to me is healing. And that is what the world needs right now. So in a very small space, I hope that I can provide that with sort of a sanctuary of a place close to Toronto where people can do exactly that, come together, heal, exchange, get nourished, reflect, and get strengthened back into their world. I want to thank you for joining us. It has been an absolute delight to have you. Your story is so good in so many different ways, and I appreciate you taking the time to tell it to us. I've told your story many times, and now I can just lead them to this podcast to tell your story. So. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to hear your perspective and congratulations again on the great achievement that you've been able to build a great business and now doing it again. Well, thank you, Mario. And thank you for the opportunity. Take care.